I'd like to talk about the T3 thyroid hormone. So many of you may already know that when you try to get your thyroid assessed, your endocrinologist or your primary care doctor often says, oh no, you don't need that. We just need a TSH if, if they even agree to test your thyroid. Often they, uh, dis they won't let you get your thyroid tested. But when they do test it, they'll just test a TSH. Well, you need to know that they've been doing this for 30, 40 years. That is refusing to test the free T3. That's how you measure the status of your T3 thyroid hormone, the free or unbound proteins fraction of T3. They would argue that all you need is a TSH to get your thyroid just right, and they've been pushing back, refusing to test it, and refusing to even replace T3 or address low T3 status. Well, it's New science is telling us they were completely wrong. The science is telling us that T3 is far more important than ever thought. And there's emerging evidence to tell us not only does T3 decline with aging expectedly. In other words, as we go to age beyond age 20, T3, free T3 levels drop by the age of 70 or 80. It's rock bottom. And that that low T3, low free T3 has been associated with an increase in both total mortality and cardiovascular mortality. So here we've been told it's unimportant. It's proven to be perhaps the most important measure of all that you can address. So let me show you a few slides that illustrate some of these points made in recent human clinical studies. So here's an illustration of the structure of the T3 thyroid hormone. You can see in red, those are the three iodine molecules that cause it to be named T3, compared to T4 that has one additional iodine molecule. Now, T3 is very important, despite being largely neglected by the endocrinology and primary care communities and other doctors, T3 plays important roles in a number of human physiologic processes. It is the most important thyroid hormone of all to regulate your metabolic rate and thermal regulation. Metabolic rate means the rate at which your body burns calories to perform the work of life, such as digestion, breathing, and other body functions. Thermal regulation is just regulation of temperature. If you have too much T3, you're too hot. If you have too little T3, you're too cold. That's a very common sign, for instance, of hypothyroidism, where your hands and feet, and perhaps other body, body parts are cold, even when it's not cold outside. So free T3 is the principal hormone controlling those functions. Most of the hormones produced by your thyroid gland are the T4, not the T3. Only about 10% or so of total thyroid hormone produced by your thyroid is the T3, the rest is T4. But in the rest of the body, the so-called periphery, muscle, liver, brain, other organs, T4 is converted to T3. And that's where most of the free T3 thyroid hormone comes from. Not from the thyroid directly, but from peripheral conversion of T4 to T3 by enzymes called deiodinases. That is, enzymes that remove one of those iodines from T4 to make T3. And the T3 thyroid hormone is much more likely, much more strongly able to bind to the thyroid hormone receptors. So while there's lots of T3 resulting from deiodination in the periphery, it's also the most potent hormone that binds to thyroid hormone receptors. Recognize that free T3 can drop after weight loss, during and after weight loss. So if you lost, let's say, 20 pounds recently, Avoid having your free T3 checked because it's going to be falsely low. Now, it's unclear how long that lasts. There's some evidence that may be a, it may be a long and persistent phenomenon, especially if you lost a lot of weight by reducing calories. And if you've been, if you've been following my conversation, you know we do not advocate reducing calories in any form, whether it's diet, pharmaceuticals like GLP-1 agonists, or even a bariatric procedure. There are smarter ways to lose weight that don't cause a drop in T3 and metabolic rate. That's a conversation for another day. See my other YouTube and Defiant Health podcasts discussions, as well as my WilliamDavisMD.com blog. Many posts on that, as well as my super gut book. Also know that the free T3 is transiently reduced when you're sick. Let's say you had pneumococcal pneumonia 
or a pulmonary embolus or congestive heart failure or a heart attack. That's called what the endocrinologist called euthyroid sick. That is, your TSH is often normal, but your free T3 is low. And they tend to dismiss it as this euthyroid sick. That's not entirely clear, but that is one thing they, they often do. Know that free T3 can be a little bit lower, just a little bit, in summer and in hotter climates like near the equator, places like Florida or Texas or California or Arizona, because you need less for thermoregulatory effects to raise temperature. And free T, this is the most in interesting part of all. T3, free T3 is most correlated with aging, much more so than free T4 and TSH. TSH does increase a little bit with aging, and that has implications of its own. That's, that's a topic for another day, including increased cardiovascular and total mortality, a slight increase. But it's T3 more so that declines with aging and is associated with increased mortality. So let's talk about that. So higher levels of T3 may predict a reduction in mortality. Lower levels may predict higher mortality. And all this, including that there are genetic variants that impair the conversion of T4 to T3, add up to tell us that the arguments that have been made in the endocrinology community that T3 is immaterial or unimportant is simply not true. It's true for many reasons. And at the very least, it can be genetically determined to be low, which can impair health. And a reduction in the free T3 can be a factor in reducing your basal metabolic rate, the rate at which you burn calories, and weight regain from weight loss. So it's something we pay attention to if you made the mistake of reducing calories by some means, thereby setting a trap for yourself that virtually guarantees weight regain from the reduction in BMR, even if you maintain a low-calorie lifestyle and a resistance exercise and aerobic training program. So reducing t free T3 is a bad thing. Now let's take a look at this study from the NHANES database. NHANES is a large database of Americans, presumptively healthy Americans, uh, uh, taken every few years, and they're put through some exhaustive testing. In this case, 7,600 of them, with 12 years of follow-up after their initial measurements were made. Well, you can see that on the left, as, t as, we, as we age, in the bottom is the age in years, as we age, TSH goes up a little bit. Free T4, it's not quite clear what T, free T4 does, but look at free T3. It essentially plummets in both males in green or blue and in females in red. So free T3 plummets as we age starting in your 20s and dropping fairly precipitously into your 40s, 60s, and into your later, later years. So free T3 shows the most marked changes as we age. And look at that rightmost graph. You can see that the lowest free T3 is associated with the lowest level of survival. The highest T3 that's in purple shows the highest survival. We're talking about fairly significant effects. Now this is over a long period, 12 years. But it tells us that at least epidemiologically, it may not establish clear-cut cause and effect, but it suggests that people with higher free T3s live longer, people with lower free T3s don't live as long. Now, this is an epidemiologic or observational observation, and it doesn't always establish cause and effect, but the fact that there's a graded relationship does suggest there may indeed be a real relationship, relationship here. Now, here's another very interesting study. 7,100 people from the same database observed over 10 years, and it asked, does the free T3 within the presumptive normal range, so this is not abnormally low or abnormally high, this is in the presumptively normal range, shows that people who have the lowest tertile, lowest third of free T3 have increased mortality. They die sooner over 10 years of follow-up. But look at the curve for cardiovascular death, cardiovascular mortality, the lowest T3s, free T3s, are associated with a fairly dramatic increase, a doubling, or even more, of mortality over 10 years. Now the range, th these are the ranges this lab used. Your, your lab may use different ranges, so you got to be careful when you use your lab. Look at their range of reference, or, and it may be different units also. But in this laboratory, in this study, they used this, these measures, and their reference range was 2.3 to 4.2 picograms per milliliter. And you can see that it's 
free T3 level of 3.6 picograms appears to be the ideal level that minimizes your risk of cardiovascular and all-cause death, at least from a T3 standpoint. And you can also appreciate that had a shorter time period, this is extraordinary, 10 years is a really long time to do a study. Over a 10-year period, researchers retire, die, go away, move, move from their institution. So to get a t full 10-year observation is very powerful. What if the study only went for 48 months or four years? You can see that the relationship would not have been seen. So it took 10 years for this relationship to show, and you can see that it really began to develop about six years or so into the study. Now also be aware that deiodinase blockers are part of modern life. So it's the enzyme that converts T4, takes one iodine molecule off, and makes the T3 thyroid hormone. So what blocks the deiodinase enzyme and thereby reduces your free T3 level? Well, you've heard of these forever compounds, the so-called PFOS chemicals, such as perfluorooctanoic acid. These are ubiquitous chemicals in nonstick cookware, and flame retardant uh, coverings for furniture and so many other products where well, they block this conversion, as does bisphenol A in hard plastics, the lining of cans, and many other modern products. Polychlorinated biphenyls, which were outlawed over two decades ago, but because they're so persistent in both the environment and in your body that even though you, it's been outlawed, it's still around blocking thyroid activity. Triclosan which is the ingredient in hand sanitizer in many brands, including those used in hospitals. It's on the way out because of these effects, but triclosan hand sanitizer, which was used widely right during the pandemic, blocks thyroid action, including the conversion of T4 to T3. Methylene blue, which is used for a variety of purposes, and some people are embracing it for cognitive health, so you can see there's a problem here, right? It blocks thyroid action. Common drugs like beta blockers, and while SIBO and endotoxemia do reduce T3. We don't know exactly how or why, so I lump it here, but we don't really know if it blocks the deiodinase enzyme. There may be another mechanism, but for all practical purposes, lump it with these other things that reduce free T3. That is, this measure that most endocrinologists, most primary care doctors refuse to even measure because they say it's worthless, because they did not pay attention to the all the information flooding the science, the scientific publications from sources outside of their own discipline, coming often from the toxicological community or the gastroenterologists or people who pay attention to SIBO and dysbiosis. So if the endocrinologist is not paying attention to these other sources and wearing blinders and only staying in his or her lane with endocrine issues, they're going to fail you. And they're going to fail to recognize that we swim in a sea of factors that block the conversion of T4 to T3. And if we believe those prior studies, that may impact how long you live, You're, whether you have heart disease or not. It may take some years for that to be evident, but they may be consigning you to a life of heart disease and earlier death. So start your program of improving this by avoiding PFAS-containing products, like nonstick cookware, look for ceramic, for instance. Avoid flame retardant coverings on your furniture and other products. Minimize rel reliance on canned products that contain BPA in their lining. Try to choose organic whenever possible, thereby minimizing your exposure to various herbicides and pesticides. Filter your drinking water, of course, because it has so many things you don't want in there. Minimize prescription drugs and, of course, address SIBO. If you don't know what I mean, see my many conversations about SIBO here and elsewhere. My Define Health podcast, my WilliamDavisMB.com blog, and, of course, my inner circle where we talk face-to-face -face on all these things. And, and iodine provides partial protection. You can see a lot of the compounds. I've highlighted the halogen component. So in perfluorooctanoic acid, fluoride is contained. In polychlorinated biphenyls, chlorine is contained. In triclosan, chlorine is contained. In other words, a lot of these are so-called halogenated compounds. Well, iodine is a halogen also, and it thereby tends to block the activity of these toxic halogens. So know that your effort to include iodine among its effects is not just supplying iodine for your thyroid to produce T4 and T3, but may also protect your thyroid and perhaps other organs from these halogenated industrial compounds. 
So what, what can we conclude about free T3 with all this? Well, as you saw, free T3 declines with aging, starting fairly young and then declining throughout life. There's also evidence to tell us that free T3 in the lowest third, maybe in the lowest half, below 3.6 picograms per milliliter, is associated with increased mortality over many years. And free T3, likely more than any other aspect of thyroid health, is the most susceptible to being disrupted. So if you have a low T3 and you've ruled out all those factors, you've corrected SIBO, for instance, you've tried to avoid triclosan, uh, PFOS chemicals. You know, that's the problem here. You can't get rid of those compounds, at least given current knowledge. But say you try to minimize future exposure. You've done all that. Yet your free T3 is, let's say, in the lower third or lower half, and you haven't lost weight recently. You're not, you're not starving. You're not fasting. Should you supplement T3? Well, this is an unsettled question. The study to settle that question would be very difficult. We'd have to give people with low T3s, screened for low, having low T3, and then either give them something that boosts T3, such as the thyroid hormone T3, liothyronine, or placebo, and then we watch them probably for 10 to 12 years to see if there is a decrease in mortality or other benefit. You can imagine, it's really tough to do. Someone will do it, but no one has yet done that. So right now, it remains somewhat speculative or presumptive, but you can see. The evidence is pretty clear. We experience a reduction in T3, free T3, as we age, and a lower T3 is associated with an increase in both total mortality and cardiovascular mortality. Now, here's a dilemma. So, it's become clear that there's a decline, an age-related decline in free T3 blood levels, and it's gradual over a long period, right? And that has been associated with an increase in mortality and cardiovascular mortality. There was some unevenness in, the, in these studies. Some of the smaller, more brief studies did not show the same effect. But now you know why. The longest, largest studies do tend to show uh, an increase in cardiovascular mortality with a reduction, age-related reduction, in free T3. And perhaps other causes for reduced T3. Here's the problem, though. If a reduced free T3 results from phenomena like SIBO, or PFOS exposure, or BPA exposure, is the increase in mortality due to the low free T3 per se, or is it due to those other factors? SIBO, for instance. SIBO has its own consequences, as does exposure to PFOS. So which caused it? The free, low free T3 or exposure to those things, SIBO and PFOS and other factors. Nobody knows. You can imagine this is a tangle that's tough to untangle. I, I'm hoping over time the evidence becomes clear. In the meantime, I just want you to be aware that there's an age-related decline in free T3 and that it may be associated with an increase in mortality, especially cardiovascular mortality, and think about ways to unblock the, the uh, diiodinous enzyme that converts T4 to T3, and maybe there's a need for replacement T3, such as liothyronine, if your TSH is normal but your free T3 is low, or if your TSH is high and your free T3 is low, that would be a cause for introducing a T4 with a T3 preparation, such as Armour Thyroid, Nature Thyroid, and numerous other preparations that combine both, unlike the conventionally prescribed levothyroxine, which you can tell. Levothyroxine is T4 only. Not everybody needs T3, so there are people who get side effects from getting a T3 containing preparation, like say Nature Thyroid, but the majority of people feel better on a T3 containing preparation. And of course, I assume you've corrected your iodine, right? Everybody needs iodine unless you have active autoimmune thyroid disease. So there you have it. If you like these kinds of in-depth conversations about topics that are not typically covered elsewhere, I invite you to join my conversations two places, my WilliamDavisMD.com blog where there are thousands of articles, and my inner circle, innercircle.drdavisinfinitehealth. Dot com, where you have two-way Zoom conversations, a huge forum, discussion forum. My blog is reproduced there, and we have tons of videos, and we interact and discuss and share new lessons learned. All right, until next time.